See, I'm, uh, I was born here in California on a 3,000 acre ranch down uh, in the Santa Cruz Mountains by Gilroy and Morgan Hill. And uh, I'm just a farm boy from a mill town in Oregon. That's where I spent most of my growing up years, is in Oregon. Still live there, live in Bend. And uh, California and Oregon, I consider my homes. And it's a shame to see what's happened to them. Uh, I have a governor that's an idiot, and you have one too. <laughs> what's that? Yeah, so are we. In fact, we collected more than enough signatures, but by the time they counted them, of course, it was 7,000, not enough. We already know it was way more than what was needed, all right? So it's hard to, uh, it's hard to fight that corruption. They've been using Oregon as a test bed for a long time for the mail-in voting. We were a Republican state. And then they did that, started doing the mail-in voting with the machines, and we haven't had a Republican governor since. And it's been 30 years. So uh, driving around Oregon, you know, we've, we've, got, we've got Ashland, and we've got uh, <laughs> Eugene, and we have Portland. And other than that, the rest of the state is pretty conservative. So uh, there's been some recent movement of Californians to Bend, which is making it a little worse. But uh, <laughs> when I moved to Bend, there was 25,000 people. Now there's 100,000. And, and that's only since 95. So, well, to tell you a little about me, I, uh, I was very fortunate to the family that I was born into. My mom was probably the best teacher in the world. She uh, started me at a very young age, getting me interested into genealogy, which got me interested into history. And uh, so I've studied history and genealogy about 50 years. I've traced over 2,000 of my direct grandmothers and grandfathers back. Did I say 2,000? Yeah. <laughs> wow. I'm not awake yet. How about 20,000? 20,000. Yeah. In doing so, that really got me interested in the history. I uh, got my first college degree about two weeks before I graduated from high school. I've got five degrees. I was served in the, in the United States Navy. Graduated from Bud's class 140. And, uh, and then I spent a couple of years at JAG because I brought a commanding officer up on charges. So they wanted me to work for JAG and I'm not a lawyer, never have been, would never be a member of that bar, never. And uh, I spent a few years in Washington, D.C. I guarded two presidents. I stood outside uh, the Oval Office with a gentleman named, uh, well, I don't need to say his name. December 6, ni uh, 1986, when Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill signed the 28th Amendment to the Constitution. And uh, then I came home and I raised a family and I started and ran 13 businesses, a farm and a ranch. I raise horses and dogs now. What kind of dogs? Boxers and old English bulldogs. So, so I've done quite a few things. Um, I've always served. When President Trump took office, he did a he put out a proclamation asking we the people for help. And I wrote a brief and got called to D.C. And I've served under three executive orders of President Trump on uh, corruption in our judicial system and child and sex trafficking. Um, I, run a, I run a pretty good team. Since uh, President Trump took office, we've arrested more than 15,000 traffickers. So. We've, re we've rescued thousands of children. 
Also, uh, in 1989, they took my kids from me. I went through a divorce. I was a single dad. I had six children under the age of eight. I'd just, just been running businesses not long after I was out of the Navy. And uh, they took my kids. And I fought, and I got them back very quickly. Very quickly. I beat them. And uh, in doing that, I said, man, if they could do that to someone like me, what, what are they doing to everyone else out there? And so I started helping families. I ran a little ad in the newspaper. Anybody affected by Child Protective Services, or give me a call. We'll have a meeting. And I started helping families. That was... 1989, and since 1989, I've been in over 2,000 courtrooms. Some of those court cases, my own. I beat the IRS a few times. Some other things, but uh, most of them on behalf of other people. In fact, one time I had a judge call me from back east. He said, David, you're the most prolific attorney in the United States. You have more court cases going across the United States right now than anyone else in the country, wow. more than any other attorney firm. And I said, me? I'm not even an attorney. <laughs> but at that moment in time, I had over 600 cases going at one time. All I was doing was helping the people stand up. They were doing all the work. You think one person can do 600 cases? Not in a million years. There's no way. But I can help you learn and help you learn and help you learn. And we can use the same documents. And that's how they figured out that it was me. Is because all the documents look the same all over the country. So... so that's a little bit of a little bit about me. I hope that that helps. But uh, one of the biggest things you've got to learn, and you've got to understand, if you want to be free, and I'm assuming everybody in here wants to be free, right? Yeah. That's why you're here. Yeah. Sick of <laughs> sick of tyranny and corruption. Yeah, yeah me too. Yeah. Me too. Everything in this world is about good versus evil. And God told us one-third of the hosts of heaven were evil and one-third were saints. We're good. And then there's a third sitting on the fence, just falling off on both sides, right? And they don't know which way to go. <laughs> so a lot of them can't make a decision, okay? So we've got to realize, first of all, who we are. And we've got to learn who they are. So I'm going to reverse that order and talk a little bit about who they are. We have a government here called the, and this board rocks a little. Let's see if I can do this. We did. Yeah, and it's still rocking. That's all right, I'll just hold on to it. We have a government called the United States of America. That's a de jure government of we the people. That government lives with inside each one of us. Our capital's in Philadelphia, where it's always been. President Trump is the current president of that government right now. Okay, He's also the current commander-in-chief of the military. And the military recognizes him as such. He still has the football, the nuclear codes. Biden does not. Okay. <laughs> Biden thought he could get around it by putting in a new secretary of the Department of Defense. And the sitting generals 
got that brand new Secretary of Defense to instantly do a 200-day stand-down order against the Biden administration. <laughs> Pretty cool. <laughs> See, then we have this government. It's called the United States. It could be United States of America, USA, Inc., U, dot, period, dot, S, dot, period, dot, A, dot, period, Inc. It's called a variety of things. It's all incorporated. It's incorporated under the District of Columbia. The District of Columbia is owned, there are 100 shares of stock to that corporation. We only know who owns five of them. Five out of the 100 shares we know the owner of. The other 95 shares are held anonymously. But all the shares from following the money are foreign owned and operated by the 13 families. Power in this country is pretty easy, in this world is pretty easy. You've got the Pindar, the all-seeing eye. You've got the pyramid that's on the back of the dollar. There's 13 bricks up here, there's 300 bricks here. The Pindar no longer exists. In 2016 and 2017, President Trump took them down. Okay, the Pindar was the Queen of England, the Queen of Holland, the Vatican, and the head of the 13 families. And they're no more. Now there's still, you've got the 13 families, and I would say about half of them are on our side and want sovereignty worldwide. The other half control the Illuminati, the Bilderberg Group, the Council on Foreign Relations, the 300. If I did that and I drew lines like this, I could write the name of every organization on earth on those lines. Every organization, every religion, every organization of government, I could write them on those lines. Can everybody hear me? Can everybody see the board from over there? Okay. All right. When people rise into a position of power, they get controlled. Now, sometimes that's a gunpoint. Sometimes that's threats to their family. Sometimes it's just a big old chunk of money in their bank account. But they get controlled. And once they get controlled, and that's in every town in America, every town, <coughs> this beautiful place we have right here is surrounded by hell. I know, I've been down here many times investigating it, okay? I can tell you some stories. But they rise into this position of power and they're controlled and they control everything. God was against four groups of people. Do you know who they were? In fact, Christ was a warrior against all four groups of people and he called them out all the time. The bankers, the attorneys, doctors, and organized religion. Wow, usually when I say that last one, I get a reaction. <laughs> Not from this group. All right. So we have this corporate de facto government right here that Biden is the CEO of. Now, if you go to Dun & Bradstreet, do you all know what Dun & Bradstreet is? Okay, every corporation in the world, Dun & Bradstreet is their credit bureau. So like the people have Experian and TransUnion and Equifax, corporations have Dun & Bradstreet. And if you go to Dun & Bradstreet, it says it's out of business. It's bankrupt. Trump dissolved it. Oh, yeah. 
He declared a new declaration of independence, which I'll read to you by, before the end of the weekend. Okay. And it is a bankrupt corporation. But if I owned a pizza shop here in town and I went bankrupt and I closed it down as far as the Secretary of State's business licensing department is concerned, <clears throat> and I just declared it non-existent, but Monday morning I showed up and I unlocked the door, propped it open, put a brick in it, turned the lights on, and the people walked in the door and started ordering pizza, and I fixed it for them, and they didn't know the difference. Well, then I just stay open. Doesn't matter if it's bankrupt. Doesn't matter if it's out of business. Doesn't matter if it's registered with the State License Bureau or not. If the people show up and order pizza, <laughs> we're in business. Well, that's why Biden's sitting there. The people are still showing up and thinking he's the president. Trump only turned over one of the three offices a president holds. He didn't turn over the commander-in-chief of the military. He didn't turn over the president of the United States of America. Biden cannot stand in front of unfringed flags. The military is turning their back on him. When I was in the military, if I didn't stand and salute a commanding officer, especially the commander-in-chief, you know what would happen to me? Yeah, I'd be court-martialed, kicked out, dishonorable discharge. It's cut and dry. It's right in the UCMJ. That's what happens. There is no choice. What are the military doing to Biden now? They're turning their back as he drives by in his motorcade. What's that tell you? Isn't that a big hint? They're not getting court-martialed. They're still there the next day. When you go into our military bases, you go in the admin buildings, in every single admin building, as you walk in the front door, on the hallway is pictures. Pictures of who's in charge. POTUS frame is empty in every military base in the country right now. You think that idiot up there is in charge? It's only because the people believe it, because they don't get it. They don't understand. They're sitting in front of their CNN and watching TV and eating bonbons. Okay? They just don't get it. Well, my beautiful California that I was born in, they don't get it either. See, old Newsom's got a flag flying up there in Sacramento with a gold fringe sewn around our California flag. That's an abomination. That's piracy. In admiralty law, the pirates captured a ship, they took their flag down, they sold, sewed a fringe around it, and they threw it up the flagpole on their ship, underneath theirs, showing that they captured it. This whole entire nation was captured by the Bar Association through a treaty in 1947. Through a treaty in 1945, it was captured by the United Nations. See, how many people think we won World War II? Raise your hand. Now, I'm sorry to tell you, we didn't. We dropped a bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and that caused Japan to surrender. Japan. We were at war with quite a few nations. In fact, all of our enemies and all of our allies were United Nations nations. We weren't in 1941. We weren't. We were a sovereign nation. So what happened? What had to happen? Japan drew the short straw, and they didn't want to. 
See, the UN got together with all those countries and said, we're going to go to war. We've got to drag the United States into this United Nations program. Who wants to do it? And Japan says, well, we don't. There's a gun behind every blade of grass. But they drew the short straw. So they bombed us at Pearl Harbor, and that brought us into the war. And it brought us into the war December 7th, 1941. And on September 7th, 1945, we signed the United Nations Treaty, which took effect on December 7th, 1945, exactly on the four-year anniversary of Pearl Harbor. And when that happened, we gave them Manhattan Island. We gave them 25 miles along the Mexican border, on each side of the border. Got these ranchers down in Texas and Arizona. They don't even know that their land's United Nations land. They were never told. There was no full and honest disclosure. <laughs> but it's United Nations land. It's run under the Council of Foreign Relations. See? So you have California. And then you have the state of California. I can't hardly even write it, capital. <laughs> Just hurts. It's painful to the pen. It goes right anyway. State of California, a state of mind. Where's the state of California located? 44 Northwest Congress Avenue, Washington, D.C., in a file drawer. That's where its corporate charter is held. It's incorporated. They incorporated it in D.C. Under the United States, Inc., under the District of Columbia, Inc., which is under the Crown, Inc. Don't blame me. Go to the, uh, go to Illinois' website, Office of the Attorney General. Click on the History tab. It says the Office of the Attorney General of the State of Illinois was put into place to protect and uphold the interests of the Crown. All Attorney General's offices were in every state. So you don't know they stole your country from you. They stole your state from you. They stole your city from you. What county are we in? Sutter. Sutter? So are we in Sutter County or are we in the county of Sutter? What city are we in? Yuba City. Are we in Yuba City or are we in Yuba City, Inc.? What about the IRS? Everybody likes them. <laughs> are you dealing with the IRS or are you dealing with the Internal Revenue Service Credit Department? See, I deal with the Internal Revenue Service Credit Department. I don't deal with the collection agency that collects things called taxes. That's the IRS. I don't deal with them. They're foreign to me. Do you know you can walk into the United States Postal System or you can walk into the United States Post Office? It's the same brick and mortar building. The Post Office is de jure. It's owned by us, we the people. If you send something registered mail, it goes through the post office. If you send something certified mail, it goes through the postal system. Two totally separate entities. I love my uh, barricade. It's perfect. Keeps me from walking back and forth. A barricade there, barricade there. Stay right here, David. <laughs> well, you got to realize, first off, what I'm trying to tell you is there's two or more of everything in this world. 
two or more of everything. There's something de jure and there's something de facto. De jure is what's right. De facto is without fact. Okay? What's right or without fact? What about... David Lester straight, all caps. That's my vessel, my ship. Look in the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure or the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. Who do they come after? They come after my shipping company, my vessel. They don't come after the man, David Lester straight, upper and lowercase the executor of my estate. They don't come after that. They come after my vessel. Name it. Who sends you a presentment in the mail? What did I do with the eraser? Oh, well, that's what happens. Try and shake things up a little bit. Okay. See, you'll never, you'll never get this game until you understand this right here. You never will. You can be a patriot your whole life, and you won't, you won't get it until you understand this. So welcome new people. All right. This is my vessel. This, is it the man? Yeah, it's the man. It's the executor of the trust. Now, if I was to throw a hyphen in here, and I was to throw a semicolon in here, and a little period, it's the living soul. See, in Genesis 2, 7, it says, And I, God, created man from the dust of the earth. And I breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So as soon as we take in our breath, We're living souls. That's our energy, our being. The body just deteriorates and goes away. And it doesn't matter what it looks like or how old it is or anything. It's destined to die from the minute it was born. right you don't think he breathed into that baby through the mother as soon as that mother took a breath when she conceived that put the breath of life right into the baby through the blood okay yeah life starts at conception all right my point being that there's two or more of everything. Understand that. It's, it's a, sometimes a hard concept to grasp because you, you're emotional. You take things personally. All they do is they send you something in the mail. It's got your all caps name on it and you go, holy crap, the court's after me. No, it isn't. It's after your shipping company. 
your vessel. The IRS letter you got, with your all caps name, they're not after you, the man. They're after the shipping company. It's a presentment. We'll get into that more later. So don't take it personal. Once you stop taking things personal, it's easy to handle. It's very, very easy to handle. Okay? When you take it personal, it's not so easy to handle, is it? Huh, Glenn? <laughs> yeah, it gets very hard to handle when you take it personal. So don't. But this concept right here is exceptionally important to learn. That there are two or more of everything. You have to think about that constantly. That's why I tell people, you send things registered mail. We'll talk more this weekend about that and why, and the reasons why. One thing I want you to do is understand the diction that I'm using. Words are very important. Now, I grew up as a farm boy from a mill town. Words weren't that important when I'm talking to cows <laughs> and horses. Okay? But the more I've learned, the more I've learned how important words are. See, the most misused word that the Bar Association misuses is a little word called jurisdiction. Why do I separate words? So we can break them down. Juris means right law. Right law. Diction means words. You'll look words up in a dictionary, right? So the word you use determines the right law under which you stand or are standing. About 15 or 20 years ago, <laughs> I can remember standing in a courtroom. I remember the event, not necessarily when it took place. But I remember standing in the courtroom, and I got this little vision that came over me. And I was listening to what was going on in the room, and I decided that I don't even think these guys know what the law is. Yeah, it's a crazy thought, right? Came into my head while I was sitting there. And so I asked the judge, I said, Your Honor, what is the law? Where did its origins come from? How do we arrive at this thing called law where a small group of men could put something down on paper and hold me, a man, accountable? And I shut up. And I waited for him to answer. And I learned a very valuable lesson that they don't stinking know. No, they don't know. For the most part, they don't know. When you ask the question like that, they don't know. They don't know the origin. See, in Genesis 1, 26 through 28, God gave me man dominion over the land, the air, and the water. And this is law. The land became common law, common to all mankind. It's property, equity, and rights. It boils down to who holds superior title and who has superior rights. The air is ecclesiastical or canon law, which is trust law. The Bible is a trust indenture, and after that, it's an instruction manual on the, how to take dominion. See, most people read chapter and verse. I stopped that years ago, and I read it as what it is, a trust indenture. See, Genesis is the trust, and then it goes into the begats. Why does it go into the begats, the hardest part of the Bible to get through? 
Who begat who and who begat whom and who begat who? Right? How tough is that? Because he's teaching you about heirs, beneficiaries. Goes on forever, it seems like. And he wanted it to seem that way. Because it's your beneficiaries forever. What is the definition of the word forever in the law? Until the end of the earth. Ah, and then there's eternity. But forever is till the end of the earth. So trusts have to have an executor, a trustee, and beneficiaries. It's the highest form of law. The air is above the land, which is above the water. Understand that. To be a fiduciary is the highest form of law. Highest form of law. The water is admiralty or commerce, which is contract law. See, all things are either held in a contract, a trust, or a title. How many people in here are homeowners? You guys are lying to me. It's okay. You think you are. You think you are, but we'll cover that this weekend in depth. Okay? See, I'll bet you hold a warranty deed. Yeah. I bet you hold a warranty deed. A warranty deed is a declaration of war that you accept. Diction is important. They declare war on you and you accept it. Husband and wife goes by their first house. They go into the title company. They sign their mortgage documents. The title officer looks across to, at the couple and says, Miss, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, how would you like to hold title? No one knows what that means. Of course. They use that for a reason. They don't want you to know. How would you like to hold title? And they say, I don't know. What are our options? And the title officer looks at them and says, well, most husbands and wives hold title in joint tenants in common. And they look at each other, okay, yeah, joint. All right, if that's what most of them do, we'll do that too. <laughs> joint tenants in common, joint husband and wife, tenant, renter, common, state. Joint renter to the state. How many people own their car? <laughs> you lying again. Lying to me. Do you have the MSO or the MCO? Or does the state have it and you have a certificate of title? See, did you license a registration? Why? Why did you do that? Why didn't you walk into the car dealer and whip out your 75000 cash for your brand new Chevy Silverado Duramax diesel and Set it down on the table. At that moment in time, see, I owned my truck. And then the minute the salesperson said, I need another few hundred dollars for title, license, and registration, please, and I panned it over, that's when I just gifted that $75,000 truck to the state. And I gave it to him. Yeah, now I'm subject. And I just gifted my vehicle to him. That's a nice $75,000 donation for the opportunity to make a profit and incur a loss. That's what I got back. The opportunity to make a profit and incur a loss. The privilege to follow statutes. That's what I got for that. <clears throat> when I already had the unalienable right to travel freely upon the roadways without tax, without a license, 
if I would have owned my vehicle. But see, I gave up my unalienable right to travel in exchange for a privilege, to make a profit or incur a loss and to follow statute. See, the Supreme Court of the United States says this, and I'm going to rattle off a couple of cases. Since governments have chosen to incorporate themselves, they must follow the same rules as any other corporation. The rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances are not law. They are corporate bylaws. They're for employees of the corporation to follow. Ah, what am I getting at here? You have three laws, right? What am I trying to get at? We have superior law. Superior law are God and nature's laws. They're unalienable. What does unalienable mean? Unalienable. They cannot place a lien on it. Okay? It's important to understand diction. Okay? Understand words. Understand what they mean. Then we have supreme law. What is supreme law? Supreme law is our constitution, our constitutions and treaties. But it's more than that. See, if you read the preface to the United States Code, it says, all law of the United States of America, founded on God principles, the Bible, are based upon these four founding documents. All laws of the United States of America are founded on the Bible and these four founding documents. Do you know what they are? You got two out of the two out of four. I, I heard it there for a second. All right. The Declaration of Independence. The Articles of Confederation. The first Constitution of the United States that my grandfather Richard Dobbs Strait signed. The first constitution. And the ordinance of 1787, the Northwest Ordinance. All laws of the United States are based upon those four founding documents. I've got them all in the stack right here. They're not very thick. Yes, I will. <laughs> you bet I will. The Bible, the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, the First Constitution of 1789, and the Northwest Ordinance, and any treaties, any treaties. So we have the Bible, we have four pretty thin documents, and we have treaties. Those are the laws that we the people lay down. We lay those laws down, and they're permanent, and they're to be obeyed by all. That's it. So since governments have chosen to incorporate themselves, they must follow the same rules as any other corporation, that rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances are not law. They're corporate bylaws. 
They're for employees of the corporation to follow. So we have those five things, the Bible and those four documents, and any treaties. And we put them in a box. We put government into this box. And when government steps outside of their scope and authority of the laws in which we, the people, laid down, then they're committing an emolument violation, an emolument violation. Article 1, Section 6, Clause 8 of the Constitution is the emolument clause. It's using their position of power for illicit profit or gain to tax the poor, which might not otherwise be taxed. Do you know they actually put those words in there? To tax the poor, which might not otherwise be taxed. That's what rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances are for. Yeah. See, we, we are men and women and sons and daughters of God, every one of us. Doesn't matter what color of your skin, doesn't matter anything. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? And we need to love thy neighbor and do no harm. If we follow those two laws, we can't break any others. So we have superior law, we have supreme law, and we have corporate bylaws. That's it. We got land, air, water, and space. Yeah, God gets into that in the Bible too, but we're not going to talk too much about that. It's coming though. And it's coming fast. It's already here. We're already dealing with it. Okay? But we have superior law. God, nature's law, supreme law, those four documents, the Bible and our treaties, and then we have everything else. Now, if these are corporate bylaws and the Supreme Court says since rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances are not law, they're corporate bylaws, and they're for employees of the corporation to follow. How come you guys are following them? Oh, no, no, no. You're required to follow them. You know why? Because you gave up your rights. See, I've handled some pretty big federal cases, like the Malheur trials and the Bundy trials. Jeez, it's really funny how all the people with attorneys who took a plea deal went to jail in those trials, but the ones that I made a state national caused the cases to be dismissed and everyone went home. Okay. The reason I say that is because everything in this world is about status, standing, and jurisdiction, status. What does the United States government in Title Eight, Section 1101 define statuses? Because there's more than one. And yet they make you believe that you're just supposed to be one of those statuses, a U.S. citizen, right? Oops, man, I can't write worth a darn. My brain's thinking ahead of my pen. <laughs> U.S. citizen. Let's think about that for just a minute. What does the word citizen mean? City is municipal. Zen is servant. A municipal servant, a public servant. Oh, geez, now you're an employee of government through your own self-determination and proclamation and check mark in a box that you were a U.S. citizen. You just made yourself subject to all these corporate bylaws. See, me, I'm a Californian. I'm an Oregonian. I'm a state national. I have limited diplomatic immunity as per the Geneva Conventions. And I am king of my land. I'm the king. 
I don't have to obey those rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances. No, I'm going to be safe because I love my neighbor and I want to do no harm. So I'm going to be safe. But if I'm going down the freeway and the traffic's light, the weather's good, the roads aren't slick, it's a straight line, and I'm doing 20, 30, 40 miles an hour over, maybe I'm doubling it to see if I can, <laughs> and I feel safe doing that, is there a problem with that? None whatsoever. Did I harm another soul? No harm. No harm, no crime. Okay. So I challenge that occasionally. <laughs> I like to go fast. Status standing jurisdiction. I usually do it when I rent a car. Put full coverage on it. No, I'm kidding. Standing has to be earned. Standing has to be earned. See, have you ever heard the thing, little statement that says, all persons are equal in the law, rich or poor, black or white, doesn't matter, you're all equal. It's a true statement. It's because you're all dead. You're all dead. See, the next word here is person. Person. So look at what that word means. What's the root of person? It's purser. P-U-R-S-E-R -E is the root of person. Purser is an office on a ship. It's an office on a ship. It's the one responsible for the port taxes and bills of lading, the supplies of the ship. He is the signatory officer. He must sign for everything. You take a cruise ship out of Tampa and you go down to the Bahamas and before you get off the ship, the purser gets off the ship and he runs to the port authority and he pays the port taxes and fees and orders supplies for the ship and he writes the checks and he is responsible. And if he screws up, he can be held in debtor's prison. Yeah, look up the word purser in Wikipedia dictionary, I don't care. It'll tell you this. See? See, the problem is we went to kindergarten through 12th grade and we weren't taught anything. How many law classes did you have kindergarten through 12th grade? Wait, what? None? And yet, since the moment you turned 15 years old and you got your learner's permit that you didn't even have to get, you've been involved in the law? Wasn't it a government-controlled, government-funded curriculum? Right. Government-taught teachers? And you've been dealing with the law every day of your life, and you, they didn't want you to know. See, that's a realization I came to. They just didn't want me to know the law. They didn't want me to know the law because they wanted me ignorant. And when I'm ignorant, they can tax the poor, which might not otherwise be taxed, the pauper, the ignorant pauper. So you better wake up and right now and realize that you're not supposed to be ignorant of the law. Okay? <clears throat> now here's another one that they get you. Do you own residential property? <laughs> Do you check mark the box, I'm a resident? Do you fill out your mailing envelope when you mail a letter to your grandmother that you're filled out with the C-A and the zip code? Oh, geez. Will you knock that off, please? I'll teach you this weekend how you should be writing it. Oh, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much to turn over jurisdiction to them. So status standing in jurisdiction is everything in the law. This is everything in the law. And yet, you, didn't, you weren't even taught there was different statuses. Why do you think it was so hard to arrest Hillary Clinton? 
because she's a state national. President Trump's been a state national since 2008. And what you caught? I lost it there. Some diction almost flew out of my mouth. Resident. Resident, someone there temporarily to do business. That's the legal definition of that word. So if you have residential property, aren't you there temporarily to do business? Mm -hmm. See, it doesn't matter if it's industrial, commercial, or residential. Those are all commercial terms. It was supposed to say private property. Held under land patent and passed by grant deed but you know who knows that they didn't want you to know how you're supposed to transfer your title on your home how you're supposed to hold it they don't want you to have superior title see this is why you can go into court on a foreclosure and you can prove that the bank committed fraud that's easy they open their door. <laughs> now, we prove fraud all the time with a bank. It's easy. Where where'd they get the money to, for that mortgage? Your signature on the application created the funds. They didn't get it out of their shareholders' accounts or out of their customers' accounts. You created the money. It's yours. You're all worth millions of dollars. In fact, I'm going to put out a statement here that's very conservative. You're each worth $100 million or more each. <laughs> Stick around. Stick around, I'll show you. See, if you're claiming to be a citizen, a person, and a resident, well, then you need CPR because you're dead. <laughs> Sounds funny, but it's true. You're a dead entity. If you're making that claim, you're the vessel. When in reality, it's just that ship over there that got assigned, got assigned to me by, oh, somewhere in here, my California birth certificate, right? Copy of my birth certificate. See, this birth certificate has a bank name right down here, little tiny letters. It's on bond paper. It's got a CUSUP number. A CUSUP number is a Securities and Exchange number regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Okay? I was bonded. I was insured for my shipping company that they created in my all-caps name. See, my mother, she signed off as an informant. Do you know what the legal definition of the word informant is? Okay, well. <laughs> You're making it fun for me up here. Okay, about uh, a little over five years ago, I stood at The Hague in Europe, and I spoke to all the world leaders. And one of the things I did was I read the story of a mother, which I'd written. And they came up to me afterwards and they said, David, this is the most important story that any man, woman, or child on the face of the planet should know. But don't tell it. Well, you don't tell me not to tell something. <laughs> so here I am. Okay. A mother nine months pregnant, walks into a foundling hospital. No, it's not just my chest slip got caught on my belt. And I'm not pregnant. A mother, nine months pregnant, walks into a foundling hospital. See, that word foundling, did they teach you what that meant? 
See, foundling means a safe place to abandon a child. See, they had to create a series of acts of Congress between 1905 and 1935 in order to create this system of slavery that we're under. The 13th Amendment to the Constitution freed the black slaves, and the 14th Amendment to the Constitution made all of us slaves. They didn't do away with slavery. There was no slavery emancipation. They just freed one group of people and then made us all slaves. Every single one of us are slaves. And we're slaves of the worst kind. We're that unknowing slave. The one that has false beliefs that we're free. And there's nothing worse than having a false belief. Because when we have a false belief, we're in Babylon. And we're commanded to come out of her, O ye Babylon. What does that mean? Think about that while I'm talking. Okay? Come out of her, O ye Babylon. That means we have to develop our status, our standing, our jurisdiction. We got to take dominion over the land, the air, and the water, and even space. So that we can follow God's laws. That's a commandment. He commanded me, man, to take dominion over the land, the air, and the water, and everything therein. Over my life, over my family, over my beneficiaries and their beneficiaries forever. Forever, he says. It's until the end of the earth. That's a long time. We don't know when that day comes, right? But it's an awfully long time. And that's my responsibility. He could put a pretty heavy load on you, right? All right. But here we are claiming that we're citizens, personal residents, so that we can sit firmly in Babylon. How tall is the Washington Monument? How wide is it? Washington Monument, Washington, D.C. It's 666 inches wide at the base, 6,660 inches tall. Okay? Go to Google Earth. Look down on our capital, and you'll see the owl. Look down on top of our brand new federal courthouses and you'll see that they're a ship at a dock. Even the grass they're putting in waves. They're not hiding anything. Everything is in plain sight. It's right there in front of you. And you just go about your daily lives with blinders on and you don't see a dang thing. See, I was taught in the military to see everything. On the way down here, I saw dogs running out in fields and deer laying down under trees and stuff that nobody else going down that freeway sees. I see everything. If it moves, I've seen it. If I catch it out of the corner of my eye, I've seen it. I'm very aware of what's going on around me. That's a trait that must be learned by all of you so that you see what they're doing. Okay? Open your eyes. Stand up. Make a stand. President Trump told me to be hard on my people. Every time I give a seminar, be hard on them. I did 32 seminars last year. Went to D.C. six times. And that doesn't include the missions I had to go on as well. And he said, be hard on your people. And I'm doing a seminar every week. I'm home on Tuesdays. But he says, be hard on my people. I love you all. You know how hard it is for me to be hard on you? But I'm going to do it. See? That's right. Not only that, we're in the time of the Great Awakening. Okay, September 23rd, 2017, an event occurred at 4 p.m. that was registered at 4 p.m., on that date, no matter what country you were in. So as the earth spun, the event occurred, and every country recorded it. The two women in the Red Dragon. 
We saw it everywhere. NASA recorded it here in the United States. And that was the beginning of the Great Awakening. That's when the Eye of Horus opened. Okay? The women flee into the wilderness for 2,000 days. A dragon goes around and terrorizes each and every one of you. It's probably why you're here. See, they terrorize you. In some way, they've touched your life. And that dragon is tempting everybody. And he's doing it in mass. They called it a pandemic, but you know. COVID. Yeah. I don't even think I own a mask, and I've traveled all over the country. I've, I was the only guy in Central Park in New York last April without a mask on. I do not, but I was smart enough to sue the airlines first. I just sued all the airlines first. Yeah, sometimes I feel like I'm the only free man in America and it's sad, I'm lonely. I need more free men and women around me and I'm getting them. I'm getting them. I, I know one of my groups alone over the last 30 days is sending in over a thousand affidavits of repudiation of citizenship. Okay. And that's just one of them. Okay. What does it mean when I say status standing jurisdiction? See, in Title VIII, Section 1101 of the United States Code, it defines status. You can be a U.S. national. You can be a U.S. citizen. You can be a state national. You can be a state citizen. You can be a variety of other things. Section 1101 of Title VIII of the United States Code. Title VIII, Section 1101, A21. is a state national. It is the only, the only status where you're one of we the people, where you're a state national. There's a maximum law that states that in which one creates, one controls. We the people created government, the state nationals. We control government. You guys are voters. I'm an elector. I'll teach you over the weekend what that means. No, it's better than that. It controls the electoral college. Okay. An elector, you're a voter. Voters vote for their master. <laughs> Electors elect our representatives. There's a big difference. That's why you're stuck with Pelosi and, <laughs> and Newsom. Oh, and Kate Brown. Oh, gosh. We love Kate, right? <laughs> All right. Standing must be developed. It doesn't occur. You ever seen a dead deer on the side of the road? Well, what happens when you get the next dead deer? He's just as dead as the last one. But what happens when a deer gets hit? And he's lying there, and all of a sudden he stands up, and he runs into the forest. He's free. See, then he's alive. Probably a bad analogy, but... That's what happens. See, that dead deer, he threw this off, and he decided to get rid of it. And his soul just rose up, and he was born again. Didn't God tell us to be born again? 
Oh, see, That's right. people don't understand the Bible. Mm -hmm. Most even great preachers don't understand the Bible. They don't. They quote chapter and verse. Mm -hmm. But they don't understand that that's what that meant. It's the only way we can come out of Babylon. Follow the Bible. The only way we can come out of Babylon is to take back our status standing in our jurisdictions. Jurus is right law. Is it the land, the air, or the water, or space that we're talking about right now? Which one are we in? Are we talking about a contract and that's the right law? Then we're parties to the contract, right? But what if we're talking about trusts? Well, then I'm either an executor, a beneficiary, or a trustee. What if I'm talking about titles? I'm an owner, or I'm not. Very simple, very cut and dry. That's why the common law is simple. Common law is love thy neighbor, do no harm. And it's who holds superior title and who has superior rights. And that's it. Common law is simple. It's all it boils down to. Has anybody heard of MERS? How many employees does MERS have? That's right, one. An attorney and a CEO. He's one and the same guy. An attorney and a CEO. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what his name is. The fact of the matter is he's patented the fraud. And now all mortgages in the United States are under the MERS patent. And a judge is going to rule on the side of the bank every time so he doesn't break patent infringement. But you didn't know that. <laughs> Which part? <laughs> No, MERS patent is a, is the fraud of mortgages. Okay. It's patented. Everything's patented. How many people in here are married? <laughs> yep. We'll talk about that in a minute, too. Yeah, you, you might annul that by the time you're done with this class this weekend. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> oh, yeah, I had an old mine. I had an old mine. If you don't understand this about law, you're going to get taken advantage of. If you don't understand this, how it relates to status, you're going to get taken advantage of. To have standing is to be sujuris of one's own rights. That's the highest form of law, to be the fiduciary. To be <laughs> We're going to be here a long time if I have to keep <laughs> repeating myself. Okay. <laughs> to be sujuris. Sujuris, S-U-I-J-U-R-I-S, to be sujuris of one's own right, to be a fiduciary is the highest form of law. The air is above the land, which is above the water. And space is even above that. Oh, yeah, there's another dimension. And it's coming. It's already here. We have help, okay? And it's glorious. And this is the most exciting time to be alive that you can possibly imagine. Once you know what I know, the things that I know, it is an incredibly exciting time. Energies are coming together like you wouldn't believe right now. And every one of you vibrate at one of three frequencies. Understand energy. Energy is your soul. Okay, our bodies don't matter that much. And it's happening. And it's nice for me. Because I love seeing the dominoes fall. 
Oh man, every few hours. It's hard to even keep up. It's just like they're just kicking them over and it's nothing can stop it. Nothing. Yeah. When you stop watching the news and you stop listening to uninformed people and you get your information right out of the horse's mouth. How many people have heard of Q? How many people believe in Q? How many people do not believe in Q? Okay. What is Q? The Q Annans sure don't know. Oh, no, I went to the first Q reunion barbecue and was, I was asked to speak. And I, and, and I watched all these Annans speak, and I'm going, holy crap, they're stupid. They don't know nothing. They don't have a clue who Q is. What's that? Bullwony. <laughs> That's right. Q is the most trusted. There's only 200 naval pilots at any given moment on the face of this planet that are Q capable. They are the most trusted. They can carry a nuclear weapon. No one else can. I heard that going off in my ear. Yeah, that's what happens when you talk about Q. <laughs> Q is six military intelligence agencies led by the President of the United States of America. And a very, very special man that is helping who currently serves as the Vice President of the United States of America. And it was kind of kind of fun to be on that helicopter that dropped him off on Mount Rushmore so he could stand on George Washington's head. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. What's that? Who's the Vice President? John F. Kennedy, Jr. I, I got the privilege of being on Don Jr.'s helicopter with Gene Ho. Gene Ho is uh, President Trump's photographer. And, uh, and John Jr. on July the 2nd of last year. And we just flew him up on top of Mount Rushmore. Dropped him off and let him walk out there, and Gene took a picture. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's coming. In <laughs> I knew somebody was going to try and put a date on it. You know, I'm a make crap happen guy. <laughs> and there's nothing harder in the world for me. When they give me an assignment, I go get it done. Yeah. And I get it done quick. And there's nothing in the world harder for me than drawing those date lines in the sand. <laughs> because that's not what it's about. It's not about a date line. It's about a series of events that have to take place. And those events are taking place, and it's been kind of fun to watch them take place. But at the same time, <sighs> it is so hard for me. I have drawn so many lines on the sand. I called Don one day, and I said, get it done. I can't take it anymore. You either get it done, or I'm going to go get it done at 2 o'clock in the morning. And we'll take care of it. Just give me immunity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And he says, hold on a minute. Wait, put the brakes on. We know everything. It'll be taken care of. And I'm saying, but, but, but Nancy Pelosi's ruining everything. <laughs> Joe Biden, look at the crap he's causing. My voice gets really high. It's like, can't have that. Just give me immunity. I'll take care of it. I'm a two o'clock in the morning guy <laughs> in their own kitchen. Oh, five, five minutes. minutes. Oh, no, I, I, that just clicked. It took him a second. <laughs> My mind was somewhere else. Yeah, look at me close. I've got the battle scars to prove it. All right. Um, if we don't know who our enemies are, do you think uh, the Navy SEALs go into to a, to an event without having plan A, plan B, plan C, without knowing who their enemy is, what kind of weapons they have, what beaches they're fighting on? How many people have been into court? Okay. I'll pick on you for just a minute because I love you. <laughs> what was your judge's name? His name was um, Alejandro Manuel Almar. Was he married? I did not know that. How many kids does he have? No you know where he lives? No, sir. You don't know what kind of car he drives? I know. So I've been checking to see where yeah. so far nothing has turned up. Not even his barcode. I've not even looked behind his barcode. Oh, I can I could find stuff. Okay. So he goes in front of this man and he doesn't even know who he is. See the first time my first case in federal court was in front of Judge Mosman, the head of the Ninth Circuit. Yeah, that was my first opportunity to win in federal court. And it was very interesting. I was representing this gal named Jamie, a little old grandmother who had 10 kids who didn't do what they said she did, which was four felony counts of fraud. She didn't commit fraud. My God, not even close. But see, I met her after her trial. After her trial. She had already been tried by a jury and found guilty of four felony counts of fraud and was facing 20 years and I met her the week after her trial. I want you to understand how important this is. She'd already been tried in federal court and found guilty by a jury and was facing 20 years. And I met her and I said, well, the first thing we gotta do, Jamie, is fire your attorney. How well do you think that went over? <laughs> what is the legal definition of the word attorney? <laughs> an actor to a turn. The definition of an actor is someone who gets up on stage and lies convincingly enough to make you believe in the character and the plot to make you a believer that he carried out that role, right? Like Tom Cruise and never mind. <laughs> An attorney, right? To a turn is to steal from one and turn over to another. So if an actor is a liar and to a turn is to steal, he's a liar and a thief. 
And you wonder why Christ warned us about him in the Bible? And yet, where do you run as a citizen, person, or resident? Right to hire an attorney. A bar member, British Accreditation Registry, a foreign actor. You run to a foreigner, a guy that was supposed to register under FARA. And in 2019, President Trump did away with FARA because it was costing the taxpayers millions of dollars just to run that office. And attorneys weren't even bothering to register. Nobody was registering. So he says, why do we keep the office open if no one's going to use it? Those guys have nothing to do. They're in the back room playing ping pong. So why keep it open? So President Trump eliminated it. I'm going, don't eliminate FARA. Let's find a way to force them to register. No, wait a minute. Eliminate FARA, I said. I, I, th I thought through this really quick. And I said, no, go ahead, eliminate FARA. doesn't matter. Let's eliminate the bar while we're at it. Let's revoke their treaty. See, what is the definition of the word treaty? A contract or agreement between two foreign nations and or entities. Why does the United States have to have a contract with the bar? Foreign actors on a foreign stage. <laughs> See, they didn't want you to know this, right? This is truth. They don't want you to know the truth. They want you to run down and hire an attorney to represent you because you're a minor. Oh, yeah. You're a minor, every one of you. See, who can an attorney represent? An attorney can represent a minor, an entity, someone incompetent, someone infirmed. There's nowhere there that says they can represent a man or a woman. Nothing in the law. In fact, the law says they can't represent a man or a woman. They can't represent someone sued juris. So you're an incompetent minor. How's that feel? <laughs> so special. All right. Uh-huh, let it sink in for just a second. See, the legal definition of the word minor is somebody under the age of 18 or someone of any age who hasn't claimed their minor estate. So let's go back to that story of a mother that I haven't finished. You thought I forgot, didn't you? No, no I can do this all day long. See, a mother, nine months pregnant, walks into a foundling hospital. She goes into a birthing ward where the child will become a ward of the state. The baby comes out of the water, is tugged through the birth canal, is docked at the dock by the dock tender. No physician delivers a baby, only doctors do. That's where the term doctor came from, a dock tender. Where its soul was taken, the footprints, and the blood was taken, the placenta. And they took the blood and the soul of the baby. They used to slap the baby so they'd cry, hang him upside down, slap him so they'd cry. They tried to tell you that was to clear its lungs. No. That's not what it was for. It was the turning upside down and the putting the baby into pain. An emotional reaction to evil. Evil puts a mirror up to righteousness and it turns things upside down, backwards and inside out. And that's what the reaction was. And then the baby was sent with a tug out to sea where it was presumed dead and lost at sea. 
until it should return after its seventh year. See, eighth birthday, see, age of accountability. Until it should return after its seventh year and claim its minor estate. And it failed to do so. And so it's still presumed dead and lost at sea. Just like you all are. How does that make you feel? You're the vessel. You're that ship that was sent out to sea. That came through the birth canal. Docked at the dock by the dock tender. Where you were awarded the state. And your mother... Your mother signed off as an informant. Signature of informant. My mom's name right there. The legal definition of the word informant is someone who gives someone else up to another. Thereby giving title and equity of the child to the state. This creates several things. Government is under trust, the public charitable trust. Underneath the public charitable trust is a whole bunch, in fact, about 337 million in the United States, SESTA QV trusts. So the first thing that happened when your mother Sign the birth certificate application. And I want you to remember, it's not the birth certificate that gets us in trouble. It's the applications. It's not the driver's license that gets you in trouble. It's the driver's license application. It's not the marriage license that got you in trouble. It's the marriage license application. The signature on the mortgage application got you in trouble. What is a mortgage? Morgue? It's a death pledge. You're getting it now. Okay, understand how this works. Understand how this works. There's 337 million of you. You and you and you. And you. 337 million of us. When that mother signed off as an informant on the application, first thing it did is it created a trust, a SESTA QV trust. Where was the attorney in the room to explain the terms and conditions of the trust? Where was the full and honest disclosure? Okay. The next thing it created was a CUSIP number. A number regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Where was the securities licensed agent? You can't sell a security in the United States without having a securities license. Where was the securities licensed agent in the room to explain the terms and conditions? Where was the prospectus given? You can't sell an investment without handing somebody a prospectus and giving them three days to look at it before you can go back and write them up. I know because I was securities licensed at one time. I owned a financial planning firm, one of the 13 companies I started. So a CUSUP number was created, regulated by the Securities Exchange Commission. A bond was issued. Oh, so let's talk about this. Good versus evil. Creditor versus debtor. Creditor versus debtor. So when that birth application was submitted, and by the way, you can't have two different events, I mean one event, on two different dates, right? Then how come it says I was born on April 20th, but I was registered on May the 3rd? Yeah, because that's the date the vessel was created. It was May the 3rd. Let 
That's when I was born. I was righteous. I was a state national. I was a Californian until May the 3rd. That was my birthright status. Understand that. To be a state national is your birthright status, and they took it away from you by your lack of knowledge, your consent, your tacit agreement in some cases, most cases. And they took it away. And they took those unalienable rights that I have away on May the 3rd. And they gave me civil rights and privileges. See, the only rights a citizen has is civil rights and privileges. Okay? That's it. State national has unalienable rights. So on the credit side, they issued... And if you were born between 1933 and 1975, the amount was $630,000 is what you were bonded for and what your investment started out as. Okay. If you were born after 1975 to 1979, it, they raised it to a million. After 1979, they raised it to two. Okay? So we're going to forget about these two for a minute. It's not the numbers. It's the concept of this that's important to understand. Okay? So this created a balance sheet. Standard accounting. Credits and debits. And one million dollars of United States Treasury bonds were issued in my name. I became the full faith and credit of the United States government. Chattel property. In fact, Bill Clinton took out an agricultural lien on all men and women with arms and legs against your trust. So on the credit side, they issued a million dollars worth of United States Treasury bonds. And on the debit side, the International Monetary Fund loaned the Public Charitable Trust a million dollars of fiat currency. Fiat currency. Okay. And they just threw that money out there to the banks. They distributed it to the general public, the public charitable trust. And that became your first debt the day you were registered. You were a million dollars in debt. Oh, not only that, they insured it for two million. Think of that as FDIC insurance. In case you died of SIDS a week later, the bank's gotta get paid back. In case you got hit by a car at age five, the bank got to get paid back. See, your job is to live until 18 and then go out in the world and start earning some of this money. And you bring it in to your household and you start spending it. And you buy a house. It's not the numbers that are important. I know houses cost more than $250,000. Okay. You buy some cars, you spend some medical bills, whatever. Let's just say over your lifetime, you spend $5 million that you earned. Now, if you earn 50000 a year for a 40-year career, that's $2 million. I'm being a little generous. Let's just say you spent $5 million. On this side... They invest in the United States Treasury bonds. They've been buying, selling, trading, bundling, hypothecating, and they've averaged a 44% rate of return since 1933 on average. They've been good money managers, really good money managers. 
And let's just say that grew to 100 million. And then you die. You die, it goes through probate. A couple of things you can't escape, death and probate, right? <clears throat> you spent all this money, your lifetime, with fiat currency. Not real money. You know what the difference is? This is legal tender. It's a Federal Reserve note. It's not money. Hmm. It's a debt note. Tender. The word tender, the diction, to put something off to a later date, till death and probate. Everything you spend your entire lifetime, they keep track of through your bank statements, your W-4s, your 1099s, your credit card statements. They keep track of it all. And you spent $5 million of this crap during your lifetime, and your investment account's got $100 mil in it. So they pay that off, and, that, and the initial investment goes back to the IMF, and they're happy you died. And you have $95 million left in your investment account. And the, the way the SESTA QV trusts are written, they live on in perpetuity forever. See, my dad died in 1989. And I can type his CUSIP number in, and I can see the companies buying and selling him today. And I can show you yours. Hmm? You probably could if I had access to the internet. Oh. Okay. We're early in the weekend. We're very early in the weekend. So we're like the stocks and bonds? Yeah. You are. So are we on the Wall Street? Yeah, you are. When President Trump said the tra trafficking of human persons, he didn't just mean child trafficking. He didn't just mean hookers and johns. He meant all of you. Every single one of you are being trafficked. In fact, there's 197 United Nations nations of trafficked in people, persons. You think evil didn't conquer this world? They did. But do you think righteousness can win? Yes, it can. All it takes is you. President Trump looked me right in the eyes. June 19th of 2019, he looked me right in the eye and he said, David, I've done all I can to restore the republic. Now it's up to you. Oh, gee, just throw that weight on my shoulders. <laughs> now it's up to you. He bankrupted the United States Corporation and he wrote a second declaration of independence and he restored the republic. And now it's just a matter of you guys waking up and s deciding which w team you're going to play for. That's all it is. It's up to we the people. <laughs> this happens to be the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of the United States of America, and the Oregon State Constitution. And I'm going to read from Oregon's Constitution for just a second. And Oregon's Constitution is not much different than California's, and it's not much different than any other state. Thank you for telling me that. Who spouted that off? You beat me to it, Christo. 
He's a righteous man. Article 1, Section 1 of almost every state constitution, and I've read them all, says natural rights are inherent in the people. We declare that all men, when they form a social compact, are equal in right, that all power is inherent in the people, and all free governments are founded on their authority. The people's. We, the people, lay down the law. And when government steps outside the scope and authority of the law in which we lay down, they're committing a felony. They're committing multiple felonies. Not only emoluments violations, which are incredibly powerful all in their own, but they're committing capital felony treason against we the people. See, in the Constitution of the United States, we put the United States government in a box, and we contracted with them to provide us 19 essential governmental services and no more. And it's the and no more that's very important. Okay? 19 essential governmental services and no more. Didn't say a dang thing about free phones and health care. <laughs> Nothing like that. We needed the United States government. I'm not any government at all. Don't get that screwed up. I am for government but I'm for anti-corrupt government. Oh, yeah. I want them put back in the box. I want them to provide us with the 19 essential governmental services we agreed to pay for and no more. That's it. That's all our federal government is there for, is to provide us with an army to protect us from foreign invasion. It's to protect our life and our liberty and our pursuit of happiness for our general welfare. It doesn't mean welfare. <laughs> they have no right to give us welfare like that. In fact, President Ronald Reagan said it really well. He said that the object of any welfare program is to eliminate itself. In other words, to make sure there's no need for it that the people don't need it, that they're healthy, that they're earning their own living, that they're prosperous, that they're happy, and then they don't need welfare. The object of welfare is to eliminate itself. Does that mean we don't give people a helping hand? No, we give them a helping hand, a hand up, not a hand down. Yeah. Church is the job for welfare, not the government. That's right. You're exactly right. Thank you. All free governments are founded on their authority and instituted for their peace, safety, and happiness. And they have at all times a right to alter, reform, or abolish the government in such manner as they think proper. See, we the people have power, power you can't even imagine. God said, I am the king of kings. He didn't say I'm the king of slaves. He said, I am the king of kings. So I'm going to challenge you something. Stop asking. You don't ask permission. I don't ask permission.